I'm, I'm an agricultural climatologist at the University of Georgia. If you listen to me, you will say she is not from the South. And that is very true. I grew up in Michigan and I went to graduate school in Wisconsin. And I still have my Wisconsin accent. If you listen carefully, you can hear that. Uh, but I've lived in the South since 2001 and I've worked on this project since uh, 2012. Now, so it's just a year into the project of looking at animal ag and climate change. And at the time, the project had no climatologists at all on the project. And I was like, you know, you really probably ought to have a climatologist to talk about climate change. And so they said, well, good, then you can do all the climate stuff. And so what I'm going to talk about today is basics of climate science. A lot of this is really geared towards talking to producers, talking to extension agents about climate change that with the idea of equipping them with the basic science so they can understand news stories that are going on, they can understand things like the importance of talking about sea ice, uh, other things like that. So it's broken into two parts. The first part, the first 30 minutes, is going to talk about basic climate science, um, just basic energy balance and things like that. And then in the second part of my talk, I'm going to go on and talk about climate modeling and climate predictions. Hmm. And this is not working, so I will just go ahead and use this. You want to see if it works? Uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about, first of all, is what is climate and what is the climate system. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about energy balance. And I warn you, there is one equation in my talk. Uh, and I'll talk about why, why I want to discuss that a little bit. How to measure and describe climate and uh, climate variability. Is it working now? Sure. Excellent. And uh, what we can learn from past climates. I'm going to talk about past climates just briefly, but it's an important topic because a lot of times people will say to me, well, we only have 100 years of climate record. We know from, from fossils and things like that in the past that climate has been a lot different. And so we're going to talk a little bit about why you might want to look at past climates. There we go. So what is climate? Uh, the most simple explanation, if I asked you to give a definition, would probably be average weather. That's the one I get most often. Uh, it's really a, a combination of all the long-term weather events uh, that occur in uh, a given area at a given time. This is sort of a shorthand graph that has a lot of it. Um, you can see this is for Athens in 2013 where I work. And the green band here defines the average high and low daily temperatures. The reds are the extreme high temperatures for each date of the year and the blue are the extreme lows. And then you can see superimposed on that, there's this gray, which is the actual weather that occurred that year. And so um, if you put enough of those years together, then you would kind of recreate this pattern. And you can see that in 2013, at the time uh, it started, we had a really warm spell in January 2013. A lot of variability in the spring, as you would see here, or most other parts of the mid-latitude. And then in the, in, the, in the summer, that particular year, we were very close to normal every day. So you can see the weather pattern falls very closely within that green band in 2013. In fact, maybe even a little on the cool side, and that's because it was really rainy. The rainfall is shown here on the bottom. Um, and that was our third wettest ever uh, year in, uh, in Georgia. And so it's not surprising. We had a lot of clouds. A lot of farmers had problems that year. Because it was so cloudy, they didn't get as much solar radiation for the crops as they would in some other years. But climate is described in a bunch of different ways. You can talk about the averages. Uh, you can talk about seasonal and multi-year cycles. You talk about spatial patterns. Climatologists spend a lot of time looking at graphs, but they also spend a lot of time looking at maps uh, because you want to see the variations in uh, the weather across space. You talk about air masses. You talk about trends. And, and a lot of different ways to describe climate. It's very much a statistical kind of science, although that's certainly not all of it. If we talk about the climate system, we're really talking about everything that's inside this box. The sun provides a source of energy that drives the whole atmospheric ocean system. That includes not only the atmosphere and ocean, but also ice, uh, mountains, the, the vegetation that's on the Earth, and all those things acting together. The sun is really the only thing that's external to the Earth's system that shines in. Uh, and then everything that's inside of this box here all interacts together. And so when you're trying to do a simulation or a model of that, you have to take into account not only all those individual factors, 
but how they react to each other. And that reaction um, is done within the idea of having the energy in and the energy out all sort of being accounted for. So when we talk about energy balance, we're talking about uh, whether or not the energy that's coming into the system from the sun balances out the energy that's going out. When you have something that has a certain temperature, it radiates energy in the form of long wave radiation, infrared radiation, back out to space. And so when it's in balance, then the amount of energy that's coming in from the sun balances what's going out. The very simplest way to think about that is just if you've got more energy coming in than the energy is going out, the temperature is going to go up. Uh, vice versa, if the energy that's coming in is less than the energy that's going out, the temperature is going to go down. It's very similar to keeping account of a bank account or if you're keeping track of nutrients in a field or something like that. You're always trying to keep track of what you're putting on, how much money you're putting into your bank account, um, how much is going out. And, you know, the best of all possible worlds for most of us would be that we have more money coming into our bank account than we have going out. Our balance would go up. Uh, fortunately for a lot of people, especially me during the school year, because I've got a teenage son who's in college right now, um, sometimes the amount of money that we're spending is less, or the, the amount of money that we're taking in is less than the amount that we're spending, and the balance tends to kind of sink down. Um, hopefully a short-term problem and not a long-term problem. So here's the, the equation that I wanted to show to you just to really describe what's going on with the energy balance. And I'm, I'm not going to give you homework on this or anything, but I do want to kind of show you what's going on. The left-hand side of the equation here really describes the energy that's coming into the system. And the right-hand side describes the energy that's going out of the Earth's system. And so if I start by talking about uh, the first term, S divided by 4, S is the solar radiation that's coming in from the sun. And when we look at past climates, especially, solar radiation becomes important because there's subtle variations in the orbit of the Earth that can change the solar radiation that's coming into their, the climate system. And that can actually lead to the production of ice ages and things like that. There's also shorter term cycles, which we'll talk about a little bit, um, that are important. The reason it's divided by four is that when the, the light comes, it hits the, the, what the sun sees as the disk of the Earth, but really the Earth is a sphere, so you have to take that energy and spread it out around the whole, uh, the whole volume or the whole Earth area of the, of the Earth instead of just the disk of the Earth. So you're dividing it out across a whole surface area, and that's why it's divided by four. Um, the second term that's on the left-hand side is something called one minus A. A is called albedo. And albedo re refers to how reflective the Earth is. So if you go outside on a winter day and there's a lot of fresh snow, you know, you can get really blinded. There's a lot of reflection of sunlight back to your eye. The albedo of fresh snow is very high. It's 90% or more. So most of the sun that hits the snow is being reflected right back away from it. Um, and if you have low albedo, if you have dirt or, or black asphalt or something like that, then 1 minus A, albedo there is very low, so 1 minus A would be very high. And the, the reason that's important is because when the sun hits the earth, there's a certain amount of area that's white, reflects sunlight back to space. That can either be from snow, uh, either in the, in the form of, of seasonal snow or glaciers, uh, the ice caps in Greenland, the ice cap in Antarctica, uh, the sea ice that's in, the, in both the Arctic and the Antarctic are very highly reflective. So if you've got a certain amount of that, it's going to be reflected back to space. And the average albedo for the Earth is about 30%. Varies a little bit depending on the number of clouds, but it's something like that. It's related to the ocean, it's related to the land surfaces, and so on. And one of the, the issues that comes up when you talk about something like sea ice is that sea ice is one of the things that really affects the albedo of the Earth. So if, if sea ice is going down, then what you're doing is you're changing what's going on on the left-hand side of the equation. The albedo, there's less sea ice and the albedo is lower. More of the energy from the sun stays in the system. It doesn't get reflected back out into space. And so with less sea ice, we have to worry about more energy getting into the system. More energy getting into the system balances out what's going out, and it means that at least until we reach a new equilibrium, we're likely to get uh, temperatures going up. And so that's one of the reasons that we look at that. 
On the right-hand side of the equation, we have a constant epsilon, which is just an atmospheric constant, and sigma. Epsilon is related to um, the, the kinds of gas that are in the atmosphere. So it can change to a certain extent. If you have more greenhouse gases, then it's going to change epsilon to a certain extent. Uh, the sigma here is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which if you think back to high school chemistry, you might vaguely remember as part of the ideal gas law a um, long time ago. And then T, which is just the temperature of the Earth. And it's to the fourth power, so you see it a change here is going to have some change in the temperature over time if they balance out. Obviously, this is not something that's instantaneous. It takes time to balance. And so really when you're talking about the, the climate system as a whole, you're really trying to come up with a way to figure out how these two sides react to each other. In reality, of course, it's a lot more complicated than that because you don't have just one number. You've got all kinds of things going on. This is a diagram which just shows uh, the relationship between aerosols and gases and what's going on as they interact between the ocean and the atmosphere, emissions from humans as well as emissions from trees and things like that, uh, the effect of clouds, and all these things interact together. And so when you really want to build a good climate model, you've got to take all that stuff into account. A lot of it happens in the form of what we call feedbacks. Feedbacks can be both positive and negative. Um, one feedback that you might have heard of before is if you're at a concert, you hear a squealing in the microphone. And what that means is that usually the microphone is placed in such a way that there's a speaker right behind it. You talk into it, uh, the sound comes out from the speaker, goes into the microphone, and gets amplified until you get a squeal. We call that a positive, a positive feedback because when that happens, you're yeah, initial uh, pulse, initial speech, or initial piece of music or something like that goes in, and it gets louder and louder and louder over time. So it's positive. A small increase can lead to a large change in uh, something that's going on. So one example in the Earth system for that is you got sun shining on the snow and ice, maybe at the, at the uh, Arctic, in the Arctic sea ice, or land ice in Green, Greenland. That sun melts the snow, make, goes from a white high albedo area to a low dark albedo. So more sunlight stays near the surface, more ocean is exposed, there's a lower albedo overall in that area. You get more energy, the temperature goes up, temperature goes up, it melts even more snow and ice. And so you get that kind of feedback where the snow and ice can vanish very rapidly. And so that's something that... Um, people have to keep in mind is one of the feedbacks. Remember, there's a lot of these going on all at the same time. At the same time, there's also some other feedbacks that are what we call negative. In other words, if you push something one way, other things happen within the system to push it back the other way. An example of this is if you have surface temperature increasing slightly, maybe over the ocean, um, for whatever reason, ocean currents change, that increases evaporation and with more evaporation, you get more low clouds. Low clouds have a higher albedo. They, they block some of the sun. They reflect more back to space. That tends to cool the temperature. The temperature is cooler. You get less evaporation. You get less clouds. And it kind of swings back and forth the other way. So a negative feedback, if you push on something, it just kind of swings back the other way. Positive feedback, if you push on something, it goes even further, the same direction. And that all... All those feedbacks with all those different variables are acting together to be part of the climate system. And part of the reason that it's so hard to get a good climate model is that you have to keep track of all these different things all at the same time. So that makes it hard. Well, what controls the climate at a given point on the Earth? Um, one of the things that controls it is where we are in the globe. And there it's mostly related to the latitude because if we're closer to the equator, the sun comes down on us more directly. So that really tells us something about um, the strength of the sun's energy at a particular spot. Where you are in the continent is important because it tells where the wind is coming from and the characteristics of the air that it's bringing. The diagram down here, uh, here's Athens, Georgia. We have really, in the winter, most of our wind comes from across the United States and from Canada, and it's pretty cold and pretty dry because the, it's coming from a long ways over land that's also very cold and dry. In the summer, most of our wind tends to be from the southwest. So it's from the Gulf of Mexico. 
If you've ever been down to the Gulf, you know it's pretty warm, and of course it's very humid, and so in the summer we have a considerably different climate. Now as you move up here to New York and the Northeast, you're going to continue to see that winter uh, contribution from the Northwest, and it's going to be in the winter fairly cold and dry, but you're also going to get a contribution from the Atlantic Ocean, and the nor nor'easters especially. So you got that contribution. Uh, also in some parts of the, of the uh, Northeast, you have the, the contributions of the lakes. Now I grew up in Western Michigan in Grand Rapids, and we had a lot of lake effect there. Every winter, uh, it was not particularly cold. We had a lot of snow, we had clouds every day. And so when I moved from, from um, Grand Rapids here over to graduate school in Madison, Wisconsin, on the other side of the lake, it was probably 10 to 15 degrees colder on the average every day, but it was sunny. And so just that little difference of the cloud cover can really make a difference in the local climate. But where we are in the continent tells us something about uh, the relative effects of, of the continental cold air um, and, the, and the warm, moist air from the, either the Gulf of Mexico, if you're down farther south, or from the Atlantic. Of course, if you're on the west coast, then you have to worry about the effects of the Pacific Ocean. All those things matter. Landforms and water are important. As I mentioned before, the, the lake certainly can make a difference. Uh, the elevation makes a big difference. In Georgia, we've got a lot of coastal areas, but we also have mountains. Of course, in New York, you've got the same thing. You've got the coastal areas near New York City, but then you also have the highlands and, and the Adirondacks and things like that. And the valleys can make a huge difference because the cold air will sink down into the valleys in the winter and cause some differences in that. Uh, even locally, this is a picture near my house. There's a little tiny valley there. And often in early mornings, uh, when it's cool out, we'll get fog developing just in that low-lying area. So if you have a field and you're worried about what the, what the climate is like in that field, if there's some variation in topography in the field or variation in the soil, uh, you can actually see variations across a field that doesn't even have to be very big. Local climate, or sometimes we call that microclimate, can be very important. Or if you're a gardener, you might be able to grow things on the south side of your house you wouldn't grow on the north side of the house because of differences in the microclimate there. We measure climate in a bunch of different ways. Um, the variables that we tend to look at most often are temperature and precipitation. If you're a farmer, sometimes those aren't the most useful. If, if as a climatologist, I say on the average, the temperature is going to go up one degree or two degrees. Average temperatures aren't very useful because most farmers don't make a lot of decisions based on annual average temperatures. They make decisions based on the length of the growing season or on the number of days with temperatures above a certain level. Uh, historically, a lot of the climate models haven't been very good at answering those questions. And as, as climatologists have tried to interact more with people who use that, we've realized that you, you've got to come up with variables that people are going to be able to make decisions based on. So some other things that are starting to be looked at more are things like cloudiness, humidity, which Stephen's going to talk about later when he talks about heat stress um, on, on the cattle and so on, uh, become more important. There are things that historically have not been looked at as often. They're harder to measure, for one thing. The instruments aren't as good. Um, and so they have not tended to be used. Wind speed and direction, as you saw earlier, the, where the wind is coming from can really determine what your climate is like locally. But historically, they haven't done a lot of work with climate models to look at that. And solar radiation can also be important uh, if you're worried about crops that depend on a certain amount of um, sunlight to really grow well. There's a lot of different ways to describe climate. Uh, climatologists often look at these seasonal patterns. You see the warmest temperatures uh, tend to be in the summer, at least in the northern hemisphere. And there's a regular seasonal cycle that's related to the solar radiation. Um, but this also related to other things like the amount of cloudiness and where the wind is coming from, related to the orbit around the sun. Now, it turns out that for us, the, the time of year that the sun is closest to the Earth is actually in January, which doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem very... You'd think that we would be the coldest when we were farthest from the sun and the warmest when we were closest to the sun, but really it's this the tilt of the Earth that drives a lot more of that seasonality than the distance to or from the sun. And so that becomes much more important. There's a lot of other ways to describe climate as well. You can talk about where the storm tracks are. That becomes very important when we talk about things like climate variability 
uh, because storm tracks tend to follow where the biggest extremes and, and temperature gradient are, changes in temperature over time. And so that becomes more important. In the winter, the whole system kind of shoves to the south. And there's a lot more activity in uh, the southern part of the United States as far as storms going through. In the winter, it tends to move farther to the north. You see a lot more here. When I was in Wisconsin, the biggest season, the biggest month of the year for severe storms in northern Wisconsin was July. That's because that storm track was farthest to the north, so the most active weather was up to the north. In the summer in Georgia, we, we very seldom get a lot of, of thunderstorm activity. Well, we get pop-up thunderstorms, but we don't really get very much frontal uh, storm activity from cold fronts coming through the area because they're mostly confined to the northern parts of the country. We're up here. One of the nicest things about being in Wisconsin was that even in the middle of the summer, you could still, if you wanted, um, you plan on having cold fronts come through every few days. I got uh, married in July in, uh, in Madison, and it was July 13, which is climatologically just about the hottest day of the year, in a church with no air conditioning. And yet um, a cold front came through the day before, and it was a perfect day. Um, when my husband said I planned it on purpose, but I didn't, but I'll take credit for it. Um, <laughs> And so that was really nice, but you wouldn't see that happen in Georgia. The storm track is just too far to the north that time of year uh, to plan for it. And there's other things like looking at uh, paths of hurricanes and so on that can also help to define the climatology. Of course, besides the climatology, the average weather over time, there's a lot of climate variability as well. Year-to-year uh, -year variations. Um, some of the things that can cause that are things like ocean temperatures, and that includes El Nino and La Nina. Um, there can be conditions in other parts of the country that kind of shift the weather patterns over time. This past couple of years, we've seen a, a ridge of high pressure in the western part of the United States, which has caused or helped contribute to the drought in California and the Pacific Northwest, but <coughs> has also um, led to a low pressure in the east and led to relatively cool conditions in the eastern United States, which you've seen the last couple of years, and we've seen down in Georgia as well. Um, other things that can cause climate variability, some people wonder about sunspots. Um, I think there's been some research on that. There's, there's a lot of discussion, but not a, a lot more heat than there is light. Um, El Nino and La Nina, how many of you have heard those terms before? Most people have. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. It's been in the news a lot the last few days, um, actually the last few months, because we're in the midst of a, of a strong El Nino right now, and it's expected to last for at least the next few months. So this is a picture of temperature anomalies in uh, 1997 and 1998. White is above normal temperatures. Purple is below normal. Um, this was the last really strong El Nino that existed. Um, you can see the temperatures in the eastern Pacific Ocean were a lot above normal. And the effect of having those really warm temperatures above the, above the um, ocean where the temperatures are so warm, you get a lot more thunderstorm activity than usual. So it kind of acts like putting a rock into a river. It moves the, the flow of air around. And as it diverts it to other places, then you can uh, see changes in the effect of, of conditions that occur with that. And El, La Nina is just the opposite of that. It's colder than usual water, again, in the eastern Pacific Ocean, which can cause effects really across the whole world, not just in one part. You can see this is the diagram. The reds are El Ninos when the water is warmer than usual. The blues are La Ninas. And, you know, it's not exactly regular, but it happens every three to five years on the average. Um, and if you also look carefully, you can see early in the record, from 1950 to about 1975, there's more blue than there was red, and then there was a period where we had a lot more El Ninos, and lately we've gone back towards more La Nina. So there's some evidence there that there's longer term cycles in the ocean as well um, that could be related partly to changes in hurricanes, um, probably some, some internal ocean variability that we really don't have a good handle on yet. And right now we're in... Uh, uh, it's been a moderate El Nino for the last few months. We thought it was going to happen about a year that before it did. And then really this year it's developed. I think if you put the latest graph on here, it now would be spiking up. This is the one that everyone is comparing it to, the last really strong one, 1997 and 98. And a lot of the media 
stories in the last few weeks have been about this, how, how strong this one is likely to be and some of the impacts of that. Um, when you look at the impacts of an El Nino on the, on the north, northern part of the United States, there tends to be a large area of above normal uh, temperatures in the winter months. So that means this coming winter, you might expect, uh, in the absence of any other information, to have a warmer than usual winter. When I was in Wisconsin, you could relate El Nino very carefully or very deliberately to the um, amount of ice on the lakes. I have friends who are ice fishermen. And in El Nino winters, the, light, the lakes froze later and they broke up earlier. So the ice fishing season was a lot shorter in El Nino winters uh, than it is in other, other years, which was kind of disappointing to some of them since they like to get out and party on the, on the ice. Uh, down in the southeast, we, on, by comparison, we tend to be cool and wet because the storm track moves so that it's right over the southern part of the United States. And we're cool not because the air is necessarily that cold, but because there's, there's clouds, and the clouds keep the sun from coming in, and that helps to keep things cold. El Nino and La Nina happen, and you can, you can do statistical analyses which show... Uh, what the what the average extent is, this is um, for June, July, and August for the whole country, um, shows that in general El Nino tends to have a little cooler than usual summers, and that it happens fairly frequently. But there's also a lot, the long-term trend that I showed you earlier of warming conditions. So those two things are kind of counterbalancing. And that's what's making it even harder to predict the impacts of El Nino now, because not only do you have the up and down of the El Nino, but you also have this long-term trend that you have to uh, look at. So um, even though over the long haul, we would expect El Nino to be a little cooler and wetter in the summer uh, in the Northeast, it doesn't always happen because you also have a lot of variability and you also have this long-term trend. Another thing that can affect variability of climate from year to year is the effect of volcanoes. This is a time series which shows uh, some of the stronger volcanoes, this is Krakatoa. You can see some cooling after the Krakatoa. Agon, which is down in uh, also, see that's also in the uh, Indonesian archipelago. And Pinatubo, 1992, which was really the last really strong volcanic eruption that occurred. And usually for several years after one of those big eruptions, we have cooling. So the next time we have a big volcanic eruption in either um, the equatorial regions or in the northern hemisphere, we're likely to see cooler summers for the next couple of years. Did Mount St. Helens impact and then did uh, one more year or two ago that impacted all the flights out of here? Yeah, Mount St. Helens, if you remember the videos, it mostly went sideways. Um, the, the effect of putting volcanic dust high into the atmosphere was actually pretty small compared to some of the other ones. And really what's causing the impact of volcanic eruptions is how much sulfuric acid gets high into the atmosphere. Because those sulfuric acid drops act like little, little glass beads, like the reflective beads in a stop sign. And so if you have a lot of that in the atmosphere, the albedo changes and a lot of sunlight never makes it to the ground. But Mount St. Helens was mostly ash. It went more sideways. It didn't have a lot of the sulfuric acid. And the one, the, the one in Iceland a couple of years ago, I think, again, was more ash. And it was fairly high, high latitude, so it didn't get down to the tropics. It didn't cover as much of the globe, so the, the effects on the albedo were more limited. So the ones that you really look for are the ones that are in the tropics that go straight up and put up a lot of sulfur into the, into the atmosphere. Sunspots are another thing that has been um, an issue, and I'm not going to talk about that now. Just want to talk for just briefly a minute about past climates. A lot of people say, well, you know, we've got only 100 years or so of records. How do we know what was happening before that? You can use things called proxy, pro proxy data. Proxy data means we don't have an exact instrumental measurement, but we can measure things like tree rings. Or we can look at ice cores or lake sediments, um, and we can make some, make some uh, calculations that will tell us a little bit about the climate over time. In a tree ring, if you have a big fat ring, it means the tree was growing well, it was happy, uh, obviously had a lot of water, had good temperature. If they're really close together, it means a dry climate, maybe a drought. Um, so all those things can help us look farther ahead, 
And of course, when you, you, you want to study past climates because you want to get the best understanding of the climate over a long time period. Because if we're going to project forward in time, we also need to know what happened as far back as we can to get a better handle on that. So we study past climates to um, explain differences from the present climate, but also to give us a clue what it might be like in the future. And it also is very useful when we get to climate modeling, which I'll cover in the second half, um, to really give us a confidence that the models are, are acting properly. And I'm going to stop right here.